Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, welcome everyone to our biweekly meeting. Today we have um, Dula from Google uh, presenting the work that has been done on uh, supporting Kubernetes native job queuing. Uh, maybe Abdullah, maybe you can also just briefly introduce the the batch working group and the work that uh, has been put there uh, briefly, because uh, kind of on topic. Mm -hmm. If you if you can say a couple of words, uh, yeah. the, the the link has been circulated, but uh, just just to put it in context as well. Yeah. Otherwise, I suggest uh, like we listen to uh, Abdullah, and then we should have plenty of time for discussion. This should be a good one. Okay. Um, so yeah, this this camera. I mean, this this is this is the one that's working. This one is not. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, so I'm I'm Abdullah. Um, I'm a contributor to um, Kubernetes. I'm a co-chair of Six Scheduling. And uh, a recent uh, working group that's been formed called um, Batch Working Group within within Kubernetes. Um, I work for Google um, again, part of the GKE team uh, within Google. I'm focused on Batch um, as well. Um, so as Ricardo mentioned um, a couple months ago, about a month ago, we proposed to form a new working group within Kubernetes um, to focus on Batch. And um, uh, reduce the fragmentation on efforts related to batch workloads within core Kubernetes, um, and try to make batch kind of a first-class citizen of, of Kubernetes. We feel that until recently, batch has been a guest on the platform more than it hasn't been a home like services. Uh, and so we want to try to push that use case uh, forward. Um, so the goal of the uh, working group, is, like uh, based on the charter that we've agreed on, is threefold. Um, one is to enhance, uh, come up with like reasonable APIs to start um, jobs. We already have an API, the job API, but we're looking to improve uh, its capabilities, uh, reliability, scalability uh, aspects, uh, its applicability to various types of batch workloads. How can be reused, for example, um, to reduce uh, the fragmentation we have in the community in building um, job APIs. For example, how can we run MPI workloads on top of the job API? How can we run uh, TensorFlow, like reinforcement learning uh, workloads on top of it? So that's one pillar. The second pillar is um, job level management. Um, most of the components within uh, Kubernetes, they are kind of like pod centric, whether that being like the scheduler or the auto scaler, uh, even quotas, um, like it, it mostly works at the pod level. And this is this does not lend itself well to jobs and batch workloads in general, which most of the time you want to manage the whole job, not just like a single pod. Um, and so, uh, and this is part of what we propose. I'll be discussing here as well uh, in in, uh, in this presentation in, in Q. Um, the third pillar um, is mostly focused on um, like HVC, mostly on node level, um, you know, enhancements uh, to use special accelerators, uh, special types of hardware, and how it works with the scheduling as well, like NUMA aware scheduling or um, like how do we uh, basically better use FPGAs, etc. They have their own uses of like you know uh, resetting the FPGA before before a pod can use it, and and all these kinds of you know hooks that allows uh, special hardware to be better used within the Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, do you have any questions uh, uh, about the working group? Um, I uh, thanks Ricardo for posting. Uh, um, the uh, the PR for the working group. Um, the charter has been merged. Um, I can, once I'm done, I will also post links to the uh, mailing list, the Slack channel, uh, and the poll uh, on like, we're, we're trying to decide on what time is going to be the meeting. Uh, it's probably going to be uh, on a weekly or bi-weekly basis uh, for one hour. I think, um on that note, last time I checked in with uh, Klaus, I think I was the only person who'd responded to the doodle. So 
uh, to try and pick the time. If people are interested in the conversation, there is a channel in Slack uh, for, what is it called? Is it Batch WG or WG Batch? WG Batch. It has several entries now. No, no, it's, it's Batch WG. Batch what? Dash WG is the one that I th think is... It's WG Dash Batch, which is now the channel within Kubernetes for this working group. Is that what you're referring to? On CNCF. Oh, no, that, that's not. Oh, I think I we're talking about two different things. This is the Kubernetes batch working group, and then there's another initiative, which is the CNCF batch system initiative. And there will be some coordination to be done between the two. But yeah, okay. I'm always talking about the Kubernetes one. Interesting. We're, we're all at the same point of, uh, yeah, got it. Yeah, and, and it, it is like, to your point, one of the uh, um, basically things that we're planning to do as well uh, is to try and help defragment the community, try to reach out to CNC, and that's what we're trying to do here as well, presenting what we're pl planning to discuss in, within core Kubernetes uh, to the larger community um, and, and make sure we're aligned in, in, in our efforts. Got it, thanks. So, so uh, without without derailing the discussion, but can, can somebody, like in a couple of sentences, say the difference between uh, those two groups that you just mentioned, the batch group in Kubernetes and the one in CNCF? Yeah, that, I, I can. The difference. So, um, I haven't, like, I don't know about the CNCF one. I, d I didn't read any charter or, or uh, uh, about, about that group. Um, but the Kubernetes one is focused on core Kubernetes enhancements. Like, what do we do with the core Kubernetes um, uh, feature set to make it easier to run batch workloads? Um, and the people working on it are leads in SIGs within Kubernetes. So the working group is going to set recommendations or how can we improve core Kubernetes to, a better, ex uh, to better execute batch workloads? The individual SIGs, like SIG scheduling, SIG apps, uh, SIG uh, autoscaler, SIG node, will take on the execution for these enhancements. Um, and so th that, is, uh, that is the goal of the Kubernetes working group. Um, but I can't speak too much about the CNCF one. Maybe I, I can I can I can say a couple of words. We, we we had a few discussions also in the TOC about this, and 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 the goal is really to to try to promote uh, progress in this area as much as possible. And this can happen in the Kubernetes core, like what Abdullah was describing. But there's quite a lot of initiatives in other projects in the CNCF that can have a different release cycle or focus than necessarily the Kubernetes core. So the goal is really to see how, how these two groups go, try to align them as much as possible, because there's little point if like the functionality gets into core, it's probably good to, for everyone to reuse it, but to, to maybe review this in six months, one year, and, and see, see how things align better. I don't know what everyone thinks, but I guess if you have any feedback, uh, the, the issues are posted in the chat, so feel free to, to push some feedback there. The, the CNCF work uh, uh, initiative is within the tag runtime. I would add also that there are things, uh, Maciek Brzeski also working with Abdullah um, in GKE, in Google. Uh, we are also uh, uh, like declaring a lot of very important things for batch workloads as out of scope for the Kubernetes group. Like we know that Kubernetes, there's no intent in Kubernetes to handle workflow for workflows, for example, uh, and many other aspects of really batch job orchestration, the experience of how you use, how the whole res researcher or data scientist interacts with with the whole stack lower. So uh, um, we indeed need to coordinate with the other. <clears throat> between the two working groups, but there is a lot, a lot of scope of work to be done that's way broader than Kubernetes, where there is need, there is a need for leadership and coordination to drive it. And it is declared as out of scope for the, the Kubernetes uh, working group. The Kubernetes working group wants to make sure the primitives related to Kubernetes work very well with things outside. And like, we, we do need to work on drawing the lines and making sure it's well coordinated, but uh, I lost what other things, but I think it, it, it makes sense to have like separate very focused and clearly defined uh, working streams. And 
Oh, no, you, you'll be pleased to know that I added MCAD to the charter that we drew up uh, for the the higher level CNCF working group. That's where we'll talk about things like Armada and Volcano and MCAD and how all of those pieces, how we should all be working to, together to, uh, on those pieces. A huge part of uh, working together will be also watching and reacting and contributing to what the Kubernetes working group is doing as well, because that will play into our our all eventual aims. But um, but yeah, there's as we know a whole bunch of other pieces to think about, like multi cluster stuff and uh, and how we've mm -hmm. all solved that. So yeah, those discussions can take place in the at the CNCF working group that we're trying to put together. Great, great. Thank you, and thank you for adding MCAD to the list. So, yeah, I wouldn't forget you, Allah. Right. I wouldn't forget you. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, yeah. With that said, uh, I'll, I'm here most of the time to present um, Q. This is a new proposal that uh, again, like focuses on the second pillar I mentioned, the batch working group and within Kubernetes, which is like job level management um, within core Kubernetes. Um, I mean, the the idea here is, I wanna start with discussion about this working, like this this audience is already aware of what, what's the job and how we define it. Um, but quickly, we're just thinking of jobs as computations that run to, to completion. And this is basically a group of pods that either run independently or like, Want to cover simulations or collaboratively to process a task, whether that like being an MPI job or even um, reinforcement learning job, where you have you know uh, uh, like workers and and, and drivers. Uh, one important aspect here that we are focused on is the fact that jobs sometimes are like uh, it's a type of workload that is often flexible on multiple dimensions, either flexible on time when the job could start. It's sometimes flexible, flexible on location, uh, like which zone it could it could it could run, or even type of resources. Um, and type of resources could be even like type of provisioning, for example, is it spot or or on demand, or even or even types of accelerators, like um, whether it could run on GPU model X or Y. Um, and the like on on-prem clusters, they do have flexibilities in, in one way or another, but in the cloud, this becomes even bigger uh, issue because, you know, in the cloud, you have way too many types of resources um, that users will look at to manage this trade-off between performance and cost. Um, and so this would be a focus for us as well. Like it's a problem we want to solve. Um, and, and at the higher level, what is job queuing or the type of job queuing we're looking at or how we define it's basically what we're trying to do is to have mechanics and mechanisms to manage access to a limited pool of resources shared by multiple tenants. Um, and basically what job queuing will do is decide which jobs should uh, wait and which can start now um, based on a number of constraints. And why do we need job queuing? Um, again, like on-prem, this is clear. You have static uh, and sometimes small and scale clusters, uh, but on the cloud, this is sometimes less clear. Why do you need queuing in the cloud? Since, I mean, people sometimes think of it as like infinitely scalable and, 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 and can absorb every single workload you have, but that's not true. Um, there are a number of aspects here. One is utilizing discounts. Uh, cloud providers offer discounts if you pre-declare how much resources you want. Uh, in Google, for example, we have something called um, committed use discount. You can pay, for example, uh, to use a number of core cores over a, over a three year or one year period. And now that you've paid for them, you always want to have them used and you don't want to use more than them. And so it's basically you created your own static cluster within the cloud. Uh, and you want to manage access to these resources. Um, another thing is like uh, users, they have spending limits. They can't just keep create, uh, executing every single job that gets created. Um, they want to control their budgets. And so they have spending limits. 
Um, they also want to introduce pertinent limits, uh, not like users, they usually that run batch workloads that are big organizations with different research groups, et cetera. You want set limits per pertinent even on the cloud. And last but not least, we have cluster size limits, like Kubernetes itself cannot scale infinitely. In, in GKE, we do support up to 15,000 nodes. Um, but again, like many other, in many other instances, you can't scale more than 5,000 nodes or even 1,000 nodes, depending on your workload. So what exactly uh, we think that users want from, from, from queuing? I mean, obviously you want queuing. Jobs that don't fit existing capacity should just basically wait. Uh, and execute when when capacity becomes available. Um, you want to have knobs where users can decide on execution order. Um, you want knobs for fair sharing of available capacity between multiple tenants. Um, also, budgeting is not about all, uh, only how much resources you can use at a specific point in time, but also over a period of time. Um, and also, ability to set policies: uh, who can use which types of resources. And up to a limit. Um, we have customers, for example, that they open the tab for their users to use preemptable or like spot VMs. You can use as much as you want there, as many jobs you can run. But when using on demand, you have a specific limit or you can't use it at all. Uh, same thing with GPUs. Those are expensive, scarce resources. They give them to any tenant. Um, and, and last uh, is, is flexible placement, again, across different resource types and location and time. Um, when you have your job submitted to the queue, you want the ability to start the job uh, based on what is available uh, on, uh, uh, in your infrastructure and the flexibilities of the job that's declared by the user. Any questions about, like, the, do those requirements uh, resonate? Uh, do they capture, uh, like, the use cases that you have in mind um, for for queuing. There's a comment on the chat. I think it's pretty relevant. Maybe Timothy, you can mention the storage. Yeah, just in general, uh, researchers like to buy storage up front in large chunks, especially if they have a grant. Um, if you have an NSF grant and you have to keep your data for five years and your grant's over in two years, there's no way you can do that in the cloud. Um, nobody in the cloud will sell you storage ahead of time. Gaurav, you have a question? Go ahead. Hi. So, I mean, is this concept of Q6 above a cluster uh, where it, when a job comes in, it says, okay, I queue it. And you know this. This is a cluster that's dispatched to this cluster, that cluster. Or it just it's within the cluster. Uh, so I will get to the APIs in a second, but conceptually it's not like initially we will all, we will implement it as a as a within cluster controller. Uh, but I can imagine this being run in a nodeless cluster, for example. Imagine it running in a like as a controller out that manages multiple clusters. Uh, and, and it can watch for jobs uh, being created in multiple clusters. We need to, uh, like, you know, fine tune these concepts a little bit, but I don't see a problem having this controller running, you know, uh, and, and watching for multiple, uh, over, or on multiple like, API servers and, and try to manage resources across multiple clusters. But it's not tied to the single cluster story, I guess. So, I mean, is that a use case that uh, uh, you want to? focus on like first release or it'll be like comes later? So the MVP is focused on like, it will be run on the master of a single cluster. Uh, it's like, uh, okay. with, so, so that, that is the MVP. Then the next step is to how, how this can run uh, outside uh, to manage multiple clusters. Okay, and, thanks. And Gareth, if, you, if you're interested in the multi-cluster conversation sooner rather than later, that's where you might be interested in the CNCF batch working group conversation. That, that's one of the things we're directly talking to. Um, so can, you, that, can you send me the link of that CF batch? Uh, uh, yeah, I put a whole bunch of them about just before Timothy Middlecoop's accept storage thing. There's the Slack thing that I posted in the charter above that, then Ricardo 
uh, posted the issue where we're. You know, I'll 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 together. add those those links in the agenda as well. Uh, as, cool, cool. Uh, yeah. so, so that we can go back. Yep. Thank you. So actually, one one thing on um, this, what users want, I, I would add speed uh, or scale of things. I don't know that that's absolutely listed here, but like when we tried to do this with just the regular Kubernetes scheduler or building a custom scheduler a couple of years ago, it just wasn't fast enough, especially when we scaled a cluster up to a really big, uh, big size. So I don't know. I, yeah. All of these things speak to, to us for sure. And then we have a few others. So. Uh, yeah, scale is, all, is is always top of mind. You, you're absolutely right, and, and it, it, we have worked on improving that for the scheduler. It's like the pod to node scheduler, cube scheduler, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it it is something that we're taking into consideration while we're designing, implementing the controller. Yeah, uh, can scale to all like I don't know, like th um, thousands of jobs or a million pods. Uh, type of like you know um, scale. I, I assumed as much. But I just wanted to yeah. just like, throw that in. So cool. And if, if there are others, you mentioned that uh, this is this captures some of your a subset of your requirements. Uh, uh, if there are other requirements, please like just post them maybe in the chat and then just want to we just want to make sure that they, we take them into consideration uh, as we move forward. Uh, yeah, that's great. Um, so why a new controller? Um, like as you notice, plain Kubernetes doesn't really lend itself well to managing jobs with their, like with respect to uh, like you know queuing in general. Uh, anything that you create on on Kubernetes, basically the whole cluster is going to try to reconcile itself to create pods and schedule the pods and start the pods. There's no way you could say. Uh, if there is not enough resources, just don't do anything and wait until the resources are becoming available. It will basically continuously attempt to do that and it will work itself to death. Um, especially like when you have like thousands and hundreds of thousands of jobs being created. Um, and, and Kubernetes coders are not really enforced uh, like in a way that allows, it's not dynamically enforced, it's basically enforced at resource creation time. So it's whether you are able to create the job in the first place or not. And if you're not, you don't have quota to create the job, then there's no place to park it until it's like the resources are available to run the job. Um, so Volcano is uh, one of the most famous um, schedulers for, for drip scheduling. Uh, our issue with Volcano is that it, it, it re-implements a number of existing functionalities. It is a scheduler, so it's the second scheduler that runs side-by-side cube scheduler. Uh, and that causes a number of issues related to, you know, race conditions and re-implementation of some of the features and how it can catch up with the features that we are actually pushing up in, 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 in Kubernetes, core Kubernetes. Uh, the second thing is that it has own job APIs. It, it, it is also a job lifecycle. It has a job lifecycle uh, controller. And so again, it re-implements the job API that we have in core Kubernetes. Um, it, the, the other thing is that it lacks clear integration with auto scaling. Um, one important thing we have design aspect in Q is that it needs to have a clear integration with cluster auto scaling because this is extremely important aspect of managing jobs because you want to allocate resources for a whole job. How do we do that before the job actually starts? And how do you send it to a specific location or specific GPU model type or a specific um, CPU or, or provisioning uh, uh, like standard versions on demand. Um, and, and this is like speaks to the last one. It basically lacks clear support for resource fungibility or flexibility. Um, and so, so this is the issues that we have with, um, with Volcano. And here also I want to mention that uh, GKE had, or like Google Cloud, they had a previous effort uh, decommissioned now. It's called Batch on GKE a couple of years ago. It has similar issues. It reinvented scheduling, uh, job lifecycle management, auto scaling. Um, the other thing was it was closed source, and so it was hard to meet customers' requirements of portability. Like customers want to run this on prem. There's a ton of batch workers as already that will continue to run on on prem, um, and so we need to speak to these customers, right? Like we want them to be able uh, to run. Uh, 
um, you know, manage their jobs on-prem and maybe sometimes spill into the cloud or have a multi-cloud story as, or, or a multi or on-prem plus or a hybrid story uh, really well thought out. Um, and, and so our thought here is that, okay, let's try to come up with a proposal Again, it should be open source, um, driven by the community, uh, addresses the requirements that we've mentioned before uh, in terms of, you know, uh, 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 that, that plays on the strength of both the cloud and on-prem. On cloud has a ton of capabilities um, we, th that is exposed through auto scaling, and auto scaling should be like a central piece of the design of any job management controller. Uh, that, that's, I guess, how we look at it. Any any questions on on the uh, quick related work review here? So I have a question. Sorry. Go ahead, Carl. Uh, having too much focus on the auto scaler kind of leaves out the the people running it on prem, right? So I I would say like if if we say like auto scaler is going to be first and mostly, then we don't care about bare metal where, where you have a big set a set of machines, right? Like it should be something that we care about autoscaler, but uh, we care yeah. about people that is going to have a fix it because I, I feel like this story is being told as a batch is for autoscaling on a queuing system, right? Like if, if you keep repeating that the autoscaler is the most important thing that we need to integrate. And if you have a batch, uh, a fixated system, as they, as I see the list of people in this call, like from academia and universities, they have a fixed machine. So the autoscaler is out of the picture. Right. I mean, I, that's the thing that like, I'm mentioning this because of like the fact that most batch uh, schedules that built in the past, they were fixed, they, they were designed for fixed clusters. And I'm trying to emphasize the point here that this is changing and we need to take cluster autoscaler into consideration here in an environment where you have, you know, uh, a ton of elasticity and flexibility. And, and the fact that batch workloads are migrating from on-prem into the cloud. Um, I did not mean to, because like, it's still like the, the idea that like, for example, batch on GKE didn't succeed is because exactly what you mentioned. That's why we, are, we wanna start from a point where it needs to be open source, it needs to speak to on-prem customers, but at the same time, it should, uh, take care of environments where you have flexibility, you have elasticity. Those have never been top of mind. Uh, and I'm trying to emphasize the point, but maybe I, I, I overdid it. Yeah, uh, trust me, I'm like, I'm supporting this idea. I'm just yeah. trying to uh, help to define the idea. Right, it's like a pendulum. It goes like this and this, and you know, it takes this and then it goes to the middle. So question, uh, so there is queue and there is batch. So in this proposal, are we going to combine both of them together or they are they are still going to be two different entities? I, sorry, I did not get the difference. So, what do you mean that there's batch and there's queue? So, I mean, queue can apply on top of normal Kubernetes scheduler, right? I mean, you have queues and then you can put it on a normal Kubernetes scheduler which schedule things one at a time. Now batch is like scheduling things in together, right? So now are we going to combine this batch scheduler and the queues capability together or okay. it's going to be two different things? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, and it is one of the main design principles that we're carrying here, um, which is don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, and when you say cube, you're talking about the cube scheduler. Am I right? That's yes, right. Yeah. So, this is exactly to the point of this slide. We don't want to reinvent the way. We don't want to have a second scheduler running, like a pod to node scheduler running. Um, we don't want to re-implement auto-scaling. Um, the cluster auto that we have open source and it's part of the Kubernetes uh, uh, package, um, we should just reuse that. Same thing with job lifecycle management. I don't want to propose a new job API. We just need to manage the existing job API and have hooks to manage custom workloads, custom jobs built uh, that, that cannot basically reuse the job API. Um, but we don't want to force, like we don't want to introduce a new API for creating jobs basically. Um, so 
so yeah, we, we're not doing that. Uh, and, and the advantage is that we're reusing significant existing functionality. Uh, we're not concerned about functionality divergence. Uh, it enforces separation of concerns uh, in, in a sense that like the control that we're proposing is not going to do all the scaling, is not going to assign pods to nodes, is not going to create the pods of a job. All of that is the existing components. It will only decide when the job should start and using uh, Kate's native scheduling directives like node affinity, tens and toleration to direct the job to the place where it should run based on existing capacity of the cluster. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah, so so uh, first, 100% uh, with you on, you know, separation of concern, pod scheduling is separate. This is a job meta scheduler, uh, you know, I agree with you and, and not reinventing the wheel. Just the question I have is about the um, the job representation, right? And job lifecycle management, because I want something that is general enough that if I have a spark job or a ray job or whatever kind of, of of job how complex it is right it may include multiple deployments etc i want to be able to say this is my job right and queue it as one entity so i'm not sure uh, if if the current kubernetes job uh, specification is, is is general enough to to accommodate you know all yeah. those types of, uh, of jobs this is a great point and it, it, i will i will i will um uh, address that in the next slide we want to support both the thing uh, again we have users that their journeys are simple they just want to run a batch job uh, the job API, we try to fix the job API. Um, but let, let, me, let me finish this one, go to the next one and we'll address that point. We do acknowledge that there are some like cautions or limitations to this approach. Uh, it creates two layers of resource management. So we need to, to make sure that we address this point. Uh, we have multiple components involved in starting the job. Uh, and so this may add extra latency, um, debug again could become harder. And so all of these things, we need to make sure that the way that we design the controller, the UX uh, um, should be designed in a way that limits these, uh, these limitations. I don't think we can completely get rid of them, but it's a necessary evil to the fact that we wanna reuse significant existing functionality and separation of concerns. Um, yeah, as I as I mentioned, um, we try to fix the job API. Like for example, you mentioned array jobs or index jobs. We tried we introduced index jobs to the V1 job. Um, we fixed completion status tracking. It was pretty much broken. Like if uh, tracking was based on like if it basically if uh, if a pod completes, the pod object itself needs to continue to exist in the API server to make sure that the job completes. Like this is how we were tracking things. And that did not work on environments where you have, for example, spot VMs. When the spot VM gets uh, preempted, any pod, even if, if it completed, that was on the API server, had a node name assigned to that node, it will get garbage collected. And so basically you're losing progress in the job. So we fixed that as well. Uh, we introduced uh, um, uh, some, new status like tracking ready pods and job status which is required to implement uh, tf and mpi jobs on top of job api so i guess the, the point is that we are trying to improve the job api uh, to address the simple use cases and make it usable uh, to implement more complex workloads but we do acknowledge that there will always be a percentage of workers that will not be able to use the job api that's absolutely true that's why we have a concept like this is the resource model for Q. We do have a concept of a queued workload. It's basically an abstract representation of any job in Q. Um, and the idea here is that it, this queued workload uh, uh, object API is going to serve as a proxy between the actual job, with that, that being, for example, as you mentioned, Spark job, and what Q is queuing. Um, we had a concept of a resource claim here. Um, this is a bit maybe early to introduce, but it's an API that we will be introducing to cluster or a scaler to ask for resources. And this is what I meant by we need that native integration with auto scaling. This is not a, like necessary to have, for example, in, in on-prem environments. Uh, we, the whole thing could still work without resource claim. Uh, 
Um, but in, on the cloud, it will be quite powerful because if, before we start a job, we want to ask for resources. We're just going to communicate with cluster autoscaler. The autoscaler will tell us, okay, I have these resources in zone X or zone Y. Um, and then we will start the workload by injecting affinities to the workload to send it to the resources that the cluster autoscaler provision for us. Um, and, and the other, the, 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 the last two are maybe slightly not completely uh, surprising is like the queue, which is uh, basically an organizing concept for grouping, managing, uh, uh, and reasoning about closely related uh, resource uh, jobs. And then there is the concept of a capacity, which defines how much resources exist uh, 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 for, for different tenants. Um, we are reusing the uh, namespace as a tenant concept, which seems to be taking like is is well accepted uh, concept now in Kubernetes, and so uh, in this in this case um, you would basically model, for example, your teams as namespaces. You would create queues for them. These queues are namespaced. They would point to capacity. The capacity is a cluster wide resource. And so usually the cluster admin or the batch admin would be the one who's managing the, the capacity uh, and the queue resources, the one that creates them. The, uh, the, this is like the personas that we're focused on. And then the batch user should be basically just uh, runs and monitors job. Like the way that it would work is basically for them, they will create the job and then you would have admin um, you know, setting up all these like queues and capacities uh, that decides when the job will start and how much resources exist for each tenant. Um, so th this is like quick slide on like the theory of operation. Uh, sorry, I'm not paying attention to the questions on the ch chat. I, I hope that someone like Aldo or Magic are answering them or please interrupt me if there's something that I need to clarify more. It's just in the interest of time, like we, we have around 15, maybe 20 minutes if we overload a bit. So I, I don't know either, either if it's not a lot more, otherwise I would suggest we go through it and we take questions at the end. I don't know what people prefer. Or we can just uh, interrupt and then we see where we get. Um, so I think th this after this slide, the, the, the story would become a little bit clearer. And then um, I can show a couple of use cases and, and we can have questions. Um, so here I'm just trying to show how this queue controller is going to work. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we are reusing a lot of existing functionality. The red boxes are existing controllers, part of the part of Kubernetes. I'm introducing a new one called queue. Um, so in, in time zero, basically in the, the top left corner here, you can see the batch admin would create the queue and capacity resources. Uh, it could have like gatekeeper type policies to select like who can submit where. And then the batch user will basically start the job. Let's assume here, again, we're using the V1 job API. It will set the queue name uh, where the job should be started. And the job will start in a suspended mode. Basically, we're going to have, for example, a webhook. And we're also discussing within Kubernetes community uh, for uh, like setting policies so that uh, we enforce that thing, like basically job started in, in a suspend mode. Basically, the job controller is not going to act on it. We'll just ignore it. So the second uh, step here is that Q will look at that is watching on these jobs. It will assign them to a capacity. Uh, it will create a resource claim if it has an integration with cluster or character to understand where these resources are going to come from. Um, and then cluster or scale will basically, once cluster or scale fulfills this resource claim, Q is watching on that, it will unsuspend the job. Once the job is unsuspended, uh, again, the rest is the same as it's working right now. The job control will create the pods, the scheduler will place them on, on, on the nodes. Um, one important aspect here is like, how do we direct, basically, how do we do job level scheduling? As I mentioned before, we're using uh, Kubernetes native scheduling directives, like Q based on where the resources were allocated in the resource via the resource claim, Q will basically inject affinities or even tolerations uh, onto the job to send it to a specific place. Um, I'm gonna skip this one. Uh, 
this one's probably the more important thing to Allah, Allah's uh, concern. Uh, the queued workload is an abstraction that we're introducing to um, allow managing uh, more complex workloads. Uh, there is the idea here is that once the custom workload is created, we would need a controller that understands the custom workload and translates it uh, to create a queued workload resource. And this queued workload resource, if you like, I don't have the spec for it here, but it's basically how much resources you need. It's basically like a pod template uh, and account, and maybe even like you know a, a, an array of that because you could have a driver and 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 for example the workers like in a Spark job. And Q would be aware of these queued workers. We'd be watching on them, assigning them to capacity, and then it would basically uh, mark the job as uh, uh, fulfilled. And then the controller here could would be the one that starts the queued, the custom workload. The main requirement of uh, is that for custom workloads to suspend uh, to, to support suspension like basically it needs the ability to start in a suspend mode and have a way for us to start it basically by setting suspend to false uh, and, and this provides an agnostic way of deciding when the job can start and when it when when it should stop meaning like preempted for example Discussing like uh, introducing a suspend sub resource similar to the scale sub resource if you are aware of it that allows uh, HPA horizontal pod auto scaling to work agnostically across different types of deployments. Um, so we can we are thinking of suspend the same way. So, so yeah, just to make sure I understand. So in this case, for example, if I'm interested in. Uh, you know, let's say Spark jobs that are started by a Spark custom resource, I need to make sure that that, um, you know, whatever Spark controller implements the suspend uh, API. Mm -hmm. uh, would that be how it works? Yeah, it, it, we, you would need uh, to have like the top level um, um, resource object that represents the job mm -hmm. um, uh, to have these like the ability to tell it, okay, suspend or resume. Yeah. So yeah. this is the integration point, like, and we feel that this is like a really small surface area of in, like of integration, uh, relatively. The, the complexity here is that again we are in a point where Kubernetes is extremely flexible and allows you to build anything you want, uh, and the fact that you want to manage all these types of custom resources, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's the design that we came up with. Uh, the at least like the the, the integration surface uh, seems to be to us reasonably small. Um, hopefully, it we will not be proven wrong. Um, so we'll see how it works. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're putting a requirement on everybody, like uh, whoever is implementing the Spark controller, the uh, Ray controller, whatever you you name it, right? Go to the Tensor job, uh, PyTorch job, right? I mean, everybody has to implement that suspend interface. I guess that's the uh, yeah, yeah the, uh, the 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 uphill battle here. <laughs> um, hi. Um, so, yeah, it's not that uphill. Uh, um, I mean, I'm already a contributor in Kubeflow, so I can uh -huh. do this for the MK operator. But for example, I think Alex Alex is here. Alex one. And I think uh, he has discussed this already with uh, with the um, maintainers of, of the tra train the training operator, and they they are fine with the idea. We just need to to implement the change. Uh, at least for Qflow, it's uh, I think this battle is pretty simple. <laughs> it's not a battle, rather. Uh, and I'm pretty sure we can work with with other communities to integrate it. As as Abdullah said, is it is a simple field uh, that doesn't require ma much thought. I would also add that ideally, actually, that should not be necessary, but we would love that um, most of these tools 
to the job API so that we can actually consolidate on the base job lifecycle really with the core job API on Kubernetes. Now, not all jobs in Spark is a good example that probably the job Spark has some specific requirements that like the job API will not be able to meet. Um, but like we are at least um, we are lo looking into like trying to curate like a stack ranked list of all of the tools um, that need to indeed have this integration and like at a later stage if we see that this gets traction at least with early adopters and first users one of the elements of work would be and help also that we could use is indeed that we do a targeted effort and like in a stack rank start from like airflow or go ai kubeflow various flavors actually of kubeflow uh, etc that they all make sure that that we have this integration either with the job core job api instead of using their own job life cycle management approach or or this approach of unsuspending if something more complex is needed the other thing here is that this idea helps in scaling uh addressing scaling concerns like we don't want the pods to be created only like, at, like at, from the beginning that will help us scale like if you have hundreds of thousands of jobs being created and you want to queue them you don't want all of them to create pods and just basically manage the a million pods that only one tenth of them will actually execute at a time. And, and so like, I feel that this could also uh, enforce a shift of like a new design pattern, basically. Uh, that, that should be more scalable moving forward. Um, I don't have, well, as, you, as, as you mentioned, like we don't have a lot of time. So the, we have a, the controller uh, designed, uh, the controller, it's a different beast. Uh, we'll leave it for another day, but the design document is there. We created a repo. Uh, we have a, a, like a, a, a proof of concept that we're planning to open source uh, next week. Um, and, and so hopefully the community can start uh, looking at it and helping us shape it uh, and, and, and improve it. Um, I don't think we got have time for the APIs. I think if we have uh, more questions. Question on that I've been thinking after reading the proposal is adding a new controller to Kubernetes feels like a a really heavy thing to do, right? Uh, do you see this like? an actual thing that can happen. I, I feel that for the last year, Kubernetes has focused on stability and maybe even to run Kubernetes on like edge cases and telcos and all of that. And right. then adding a new controller that is a use case for a lot of people, but not for, I would say, the 80% of Kubernetes use cases uh, are looking into this. So adding a new controller will make Kubernetes heavier. Uh, how does the Kubernetes uh, yeah. community feel about this? That's a very good question. So we're starting as a sub-project, uh, not in core Kubernetes. We want to prove the case. We want to prove that this works. Uh, we are planning to integrate this with core Kubernetes. And that's why the way that we're designing this, such that it integrates with existing controllers. So that's one like you know rock that we're trying to avoid from the beginning. The other thing is we have Kube Controller Manager, which is basically, it's not going to be like a new binary, uh, sorry, a new yeah, a new binary executing on its own. It's just going to be another controller that gets created within the Kube Controller Manager set of reconcilers. Um, so that's why also we formed the batch working group to get to convince the community that there's conviction around these ideas. Like there are, there's momentum. Uh, there's a new type of workers that we need to open up Kubernetes for. Um, and yeah, I mean, I can't tell you that it will happen, but we're trying, we're, we're making decisions right now that hopefully will help us uh, in the future to make the case for having it in core Kubernetes. Um, and again, if nobody is using it, it's just gonna be sitting there, right? Like it's not, uh, I, again, like a new um, container that you need to start, et cetera. It's not going to be like that. All right.
This sounds amazing. So we are reaching six o'clock, but I suggest because we started a bit late for those that can stay to stay five more minutes and then we wrap it up. Uh, so I I saw a lot of activity also from Kevin. Do you want to raise a couple of questions? One or two questions, Kevin? Um, sure. Um, so we run HPC systems here at PNL. Um, I was curious how these queues are going to interact with each other. Um, you know, usually we give each project a namespace so they would kind of have their own queue in this API. But on our HPC systems, we have queues where uh, each of the projects submits their jobs. They can see where they are in the overall view of the system queue. So they know, hey, it's going to be two days before their job starts or whatever. Um, and and all the projects are fairly, their jobs are fairly uh, scheduled across the different projects. So one one project doesn't dominate the whole system. Uh, how is having separate queues at the uh, namespace level right. kind of work for that use case? So it, queues are simply like if I if you look at the API, it's simply a pointer to where the actual capacity is. The, the thing is like the, having queue namespace solve a couple of problems. One, discoverability. Like users usually only have access to list. Mm -hmm. So for them to know what is the queue that I need, to, I can submit my jobs to. It's going to be simple. Okay, so list the queues in my namespace. The actual like uh, like place where capacity is managed is in the capacity API, and this is not a namespaced object. Mm. And this is something that multiple queues can point to, right? Like um, it, it, like even if you have, um, for example, multiple namespaces. You can you can group them using labels and say okay all of them can basically point to the same capacity and they share the mm -hmm. same capacity. The other thing that Q will help us here as being namespace is a case that someone brought up while discussing this in open source. Consider the case where you want to run an experiment, like a user wants to run an experiment and it's like thousands of jobs that they want to run, but they don't want to use more than for example eight GPUs. Uh, because they don't want, like, for some reason. Um, the ability for the users themselves to create a queue in their namespaces and set limits within the queue, right? So those limits do not give you any promise on whether you will get the capacity or not, but they are limits on how, on the maximum amount of resources that your experiment is going to use. So I would imagine users creating a queue even per, per large-scale experiment themselves and setting those limits at the, with, for that specific experiment, at the end of the day, what will control how much capacity you will actually get is the capacity object API. Mm -hmm. um, does that does that make sense? I think so. So the Q API is pointing is a at a, a, a dedicated pool or a, a capacity. Um, the the queues, you know, jobs are assigned to queues or whatever, but there's kind of a scheduler level queue that aggregates all of the queue api objects exactly. to a capacity and mm -hmm. it's looking at when the various jobs are submitted and still evenly scheduling them exactly okay. yeah, the, yeah. The, the, like at the end of the day the, the, your actual queue is going to be the capacity um where like basically we're gonna decide okay which one is going to get executed first or not like they they will all be basically dependent on the capacity mm -hmm. all right so i think we have two minutes left so i would suggest like i i'm pretty sure we'll have more more to talk about this is uh, very, very interesting to, to this yeah, maybe, community. Yeah, yeah, maybe in a couple of months we can uh, come yeah. back with a demo. But yeah, absolutely. That would be amazing. Uh, the other thing I would ask you is uh, what's the best way for the people in this group to, to provide input and feedback and try to help out? Uh, maybe just, so, uh, yeah. Here's the repo. 
Oh, it's not okay. I don't know if, uh, but uh, yeah, it, does it open? Yeah, it did. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we will have everything there. Like the like this is the repo. We will upload the code there. We will have uh, the links to the design documents and the API, etc. Um, if you have specific suggestions, please create issues um, to help us. You know, uh, better uh, shape this project. Right now, it's just a template. Um, there's nothing in the repo, but we will we should upload something this week or next week. So I mean, uh, our goal is to have it as an incubating in um, in uh, in yeah. CF. Okay. Yeah, in in, in sorry in Kubernetes. So this is a sub project sponsored by Six Scheduling. Okay. Um, so it's not a CNCF project. I don't know, like I don't know the details here, but it's a it's a sub project within Kubernetes. Got it. Thanks. Yeah. And I, I guess, like, if people can have a look at the proposal in the Google Doc as well, put as much input as they can there. I guess there was a lot of discussion going on. Uh, I, we, we had some time, but I see that people have a lot more feedback. To give. So I think we can we can interact there. There's also the mailing list. I also linked that in the agenda. So I suggest that, like, everyone checks those links. And yeah, like let, let's say we we sync again in like a couple of months. Uh, we'll, we'll make sure there's a slot for this. Um, it's been great. Like it's been super nice. So I don't know. I, I saw a couple of new new timers. So I, a first timer. So I, I hope you you are here again uh, in two weeks so that we can we can uh, have a proper introduction. Otherwise, uh, does anyone else have anything else to raise? If not, like thanks again to Abdullah, Maciek, and Aldo for for the really nice uh, presentation. And we meet again in uh, two weeks, March second. Um, in principle, the the topic will be air gap solutions, and uh, we we stick with the topic for now. But uh, we'll we'll send the reminders as usual. Thank you. Thanks everyone for attending, and thanks a lot for the discussion. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.